WNBC, New York, pioneer station of the National Broadcasting Company. Hi, Jinx. Hello, Tex. Well, we're starting off with a big splash, I think, this Monday morning, and we have a great, great, famous guest star on our program, so it's a good way to start the week. Preview of our Wednesday night network show, as we say. Network <laughs> show. <laughs> yes, this is the first time that we've ever sort of given a preview. Had someone who's going to be on the Wednesday night show, which is network, uh, had them on the, the local New York hijinks program. Right, Jinx, this is really a success story this morning. You know, we've had a lot of success stories that we've, uh, on the program lately. Yesterday, Howard Johnson, who was just a name to so many people, including me. Howard Johnson told us how he started cleaning spittoons in his father's cigar store and wound up with 208 roadside restaurants all the way from Maine to Florida. Yes, and now making $60 million a year. Boy, that's something from an ice cream cone <laughs> up, isn't it? But don't forget Georgie Jessel, who just a week ago today, last Monday, uh, told us how he began his career as a kid singer along with Walter Winchell in the first Gus Edwards vaudeville troupe. And he, of course, now is a big Hollywood producer. And Albert Light, the Philadelphia millionaire who began as a grocer's clerk. Yes, and Eddie Dowling. Remember, he came on just before he started his program, The Big Break, and told us how he got his big break. Well, they all started at the bottom and worked up. So it looks like, Jenks, the success story is still going strong today in radio and movies and books and magazines, from Horatio Alger to Clarence Buddington Kellum. The American success story is still a tradition in this country. Yes, but Tex, have you noticed something else about these success stories? That they've all been men. I don't know whether that's been your doing or who's doing, but all have been men in the last few weeks, these who do you success think, who stories. Who do you think selects a guest on this program? The boss, you. <laughs> so I thought it was about time that we started giving the women a break. And today we have another success story, but this time it's a woman, a great woman. Yes, Jenks, a woman who fostered the birth of the blues, who originated the style that today's blues singers are still trying to top and cop. I hope people are getting an idea, but we still haven't said the name, you notice. They're guessing. And in 1918, she washed dishes in a Philadelphia uh, nightery for $3.50 a week. I was going to say three fifty, but someone might have thought it was $350 a week. I should think that's what she would have gotten for washing dishes, but it was $3.50 a week, and today she's one of the top Negro entertainers in the country. She starred in Broadway hits like His Thousands Cheer, Cabin in the Sky, Mamba's Daughters, which was a play and not a musical, with time off for nightclubs and movies like Tales of Manhattan and the Hollywood version of Cabin in the Sky. And of course she taught the whole country to sing Stormy Weather. But even before that, and now we're getting close, everybody should know her name by now, did you know, Jenk, that she introduced this number? Dinah, is there anyone finer in the state of Carolina? If there is, and you know her, show her. Dinah, with those sixty eyes blazing, who wouldn't love to? Why? 
Double talk. Well, we can say your name now, and I just want to say quickly to people that, that maybe were trying to adjust the radio that it was recording of, of Ethel Waters singing Dinah, and then you couldn't control yourself, Ethel. You had to come in and, and sort of sing a little bit with the recording, That's didn't you? Right. Gosh, how long ago did you make that recording of I Dinah? I made that record in 1925, where I introduced it in 1924 in the plantation room. Now, I guess it's called several names, but the original plantation at 50th and Broadway is where I introduced it to, in the summer of 1924. Had you ever tried singing with it again, with the record on No, it? I don't, I, 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 ne I never tried this before, no. How did you remember it? I love the way you came out and said you didn't think you'd remember. <laughs> well, it's just that, you see, when you sort of create an atmosphere or an idea about a song, it lives with you, and I don't care, it's like a storage vault, you know, you put it away a long time, but whenever you hear that, it, it comes right back, it's just like a recording in your mind, I can sort of sense the things that I did, then if I never sang it in 50 years from now, I probably would uh, do the same thing. I'd sort of know my timing and when mm -hmm. I did it. Ethel, where'd you get that song? How, how, can you remember how it came to you, the story back of how you found that song? Well, I'll be as brief as possible that they uh, was keeping the room open at the plantation for the first time in, in quite a few seasons in the summer. And it, you, uh, originally it was Florence Mills's, what we'd say, using the present-day vernacular, stamping grounds. Stamping. <laughs> so, uh, stomping grounds. Well, stamp or stomp. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I, I, was, I really like the corrections, though, anytime you make them, because I have no... Uh, you stomp, Tex does it all the time well, with I'm the Ethel Waters. <laughs> no, he's right. I like that. You do? Uh, <laughs> uh, they was sort of floundering around to get someone to, to do a hit song out of the, out of the review. And... Uh, uh, Mr. Seabury was staging it because Mr. Leslie was on the road with the Mills thing and uh, Mr. Sam Salvin, who had taken over the room anyhow, why he was going to gamble with it to be open in the summer. So uh, they had tried several uh, people down there because it was going to be a color review. And uh, the writers, Harry Axe uh, and uh, a fellow, both of the other writers have passed. Uh, Joe, there was a Joe Lewis, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, or, and a Joe Howard. There was two Joes as well as Harry Axe. Isn't wrote, Harry Axe the man who plays for Al Jolson yes, now? Yes, now. And he doesn't play any better now than he did then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love him. He wears the best of friends. But I'm just saying, Mr. Axe. So they, uh, I, I was laying off, uh, usual. And <laughs> the result was, uh, I was doing uh, the key time with the Earl Dancer. It was an act of Waters and Dancer. And I was doing a few shots because he was trying to convince me I should try working to white theaters because previously I'd always worked to strictly to my own people on account I thought they understood my type of work better and I knew I was too stubborn to change my style. So uh, uh, Leonard, uh, the boy that uh, I won't, I'll just say Harris uh, Seabury, ask girl, is that was there any possible way for him to induce me to come down and see if I would work in the review? So I have a way of, when I'm scared to death of a thing, I always used to put my money way up, you know, as I thought, in, in the unreachable bracket. Ask too so much I, if you didn't want to do it, huh? What I thought was too much. So uh, I know that uh, me being a, what you'd say, a colored blues singer, that they would be a, a little bit uh, reluctant to, I thought, to consider me down in that atmosphere, as it was big time. So when Earl approached me about it, I said, no, I wouldn't, I didn't want to, have my feelings hurt and I wasn't aspiring to be down on Broadway anyhow it was the TOBA was all right with me so I went down there to just to sort of look the situation over and to keep him from being a bad fella because you know they knew him and liked him and it would look like he didn't have any voice in sort of persuading me so in going down there this day everybody was at rehearsal and uh, Mr. X and these other two kids uh, fellas played the, the piece over and uh, I have a the term that I use, white and colored. And when I say white, I mean, I don't mean anything other than mostly the white uh, singers of the, that era, before they thought that we had anything on the ball, why always sang in unison and in a certain 
strict tempo if you, you know, I mean... You sang with it, the music. Yeah, right? just right what you call now on the beam. Mm -hmm. And I, I never did and never will or never could sing that well, way. Well, what do you call the way you sing? Well, How do you explain to, that? Uh, to me, I don't, I never like to, to come in on the, the, the line. When you hit on the beat, I can't sing on the beat. If you make me sing on the beat, I just at least forget my, my whole song because it seems like you're forcing me to do something and I guess I'm stubborn even about singing. I don't want to do it. <laughs> so You like with, to come in when you're not supposed to. I li uh, to me, I like to tell the story with music. I don't care how it sounds as far as the music standpoint. I mean, anything that has, definitely has a little story behind it, uh, I'd rather tell it the way I feel it. And if I can't feel, get any reaction, I'm very honest about having to know that you can't do everything, and I wouldn't bother with it at all. So we get down to the rehearsal, Nicely, Mr. X and them that beat out the piano and da 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 You know, it really was that way. Oh, that was Dinah. That was Dinah, believe it or not. I recognize the tune. So, I, when I after I heard heard them play, I said to Pearl, who bless her heart, she's passed. She was with me 17 years up to the time she passed. I said, well. If this is what they got to offer, I don't think it wasn't no use me coming down here. <laughs> so they gave me a lead sheet, because I don't read music then and can't read it yet. My Ethel eyes, Waters, you don't read music? Oh, honey, I don't know one note from another, and I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed to saying it, because it has caused me lots of embarrassment, but I just don't seem to get it, and I, yet I almost have an absolute pitch. I don't know nothing about music. You just come in when you I feel just like hear, it. I hear it inside, and I have a pretty good ear. I can almost transpose a thing quicker than the person that reads it, but from the, my, my hearing. So uh, Pearl and I, we take this lead sheet home, and she played it. Well, I said, I don't see anything wrong with it other than maybe I just don't like the, the tempo it's being played. So they were, uh, in fact, before I left, I always, I don't guess I get credit for that, but when anyone asks me to do a number, I'll always ask them, how do you want it done, or if you can give me an idea, and then I'll go home and work on it, and if, if I'll bring back what I think I've uh, grasped that you want done, and if not, then tell me something else. But if you're going to leave it to me and just say, oh, Ethel, it's all right, go ahead, we know you know what to do with it, then by heavens, don't challenge that when I come back, because I've asked him, what did you want to tell me something? <laughs> so, uh, they was very sweet, and they told me to take it on home. Well, we got home, and... Uh, she sort of strummed around, and she said, I like it sort of in a, a ballad form. She said, they got it sort of jumpy. So uh, I said, well, we'll try it that way. So they, she, all she did was to change the tempo. And uh, they, was, they wanted to do the version that year, 1924. They was, uh, was the time that they decided on doing a version, a swing version of the Mikado. And uh, bless his heart, he's still probably listening. Will Vaudry was the chief arranger. For, for the staff of uh, Salvin and for different uh, uh, follies and everything. So he wrote a, a, a swing version of the Mikado, and I was to be the one doing minstrelsy and uh, go in. So when we got down to the studio, I mean to the plantation the next day, they sat down and uh, played the score, I mean, uh, so it, that I would see how I fit in because I had to learn that part. Da -da 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 see? Oh, this is the Mikado, not Dinah. That's what Dinah let in, you know, come into that. Oh, I so see. So they, they started up the, I'll, I'll just be brief to try and give you the idea of the setup. It, they, the musicians, for, if you want to know who we are, da 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 We are gentlemen from the south, da 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 We put melody in each bar, da 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 Instrumental men from the south, then it went on from there. Then it got, I'm skipping till it gets to the three little maids. Three little maids from Harlem town. Nothing to do but sing and clown. We turn Harlem upside down. Three little maids from school. And they sat down. Then the music had a few passages, because uh, I don't know the Mikado. I only know that, see. <laughs> so <laughs> the music, <laughs> it's this da 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 a wandering minstrel without any tale of sorrow, just waiting for tomorrow, a day that means heaven to me. A wandering minstrel with a heart just full of gladness, no room for gloom or sadness. Say, I've got the loveliest lady, and I don't mean me. 
I'm happy since Carolina gave me Dinah. That's when I went into the first of <laughs> Dinah came then. Came right in there. And that's the way I put it. <laughs> well, you put it in front of that, that you could that same, it. Yeah, and that was the first time in a cafe. I'm not speaking of musicals or theater. The first time that a hit song ever came out of a cafe. Because as the people just... That even though it was the opening of the show, it, you couldn't get reservation in there for the really the top-notch people that came just to see that from a production act. What you sang just then, was that the verse of Dinah? That's Dina? the verse of Dinah. I've never heard it before. Well, Carolina gave me Dinah. I'm the proudest one beneath that Dixie sun. News is spreading about our wedding. I hear church bells ringing. Here's a song my heart keeps singing. Oh, oh God. isn't that? Uh, so, that song went around the world. And uh, uh, while it becomes, thank the Lord, uh, an instantaneous hit. Well, it had a, a certain, it, it also did me good later. But uh, at that time, when Mr. Axnem published the song, I guess it just, it wasn't an oversight. I mean, maybe it wasn't done. They didn't give me music sheet credit because they had no, no other facilities of you getting it. But they knew I sang the song. I'm going to have to probably lead up to that, say something I shouldn't. Well, anyhow, it won't be uh, off there. I mean, it's, it's just a little, brings on something. So when the diner became the hit, I went back to my vaudeville, what you'd say, TV You left Broadway again. Went back to the colored circuit. Because you must realize I was getting five hundred dollars a week in that in that territory. That was a funny <laughs> job. Huh? Oh, well, it was. You know, I was introducing records that uh, the people they're extinct now. But I mean, that's when my people really wanted to hear me. You know, sing. What the, sort of songs did you sing, Ethel? Oh, Robert, darling. Well, they, they, you can't get them, so I won't have to be, uh, be apologize. They had. They ranged from everything. What some of them was uh, one of the main ones at that time was a number call. I'll spell it S H A K E T H A T T H I N G. See, so you're not being censored. Shake that thing. <laughs> but it was it was a dance, incidentally. I mean, it was just a matter of it was dance. But uh, I don't know about the well. It's said now. Are, are we off as the vice president? So anyhow, I don't know. <laughs> so I mean, it was it was numbers, my dears. When I say dear, I mean plural. Uh, it was it. In that bracket, it wasn't that they were anything suggestive about them. It just it was the people's minds, which they have now. I mean, nobody's an imbecile. But it really was just a, an amusing thing about everybody, like they call rug cutting. Now they was doing the dance, and it was another substitute for the word shimmy, I imagine. You know, just different dances. And, of course, you were a great dancer, which we forgot to mention. Not a great, but I was a game dancer. I mean, I'd get out there. I wouldn't say I was great, but by <laughs> heavens, you couldn't stop me. <laughs> That's the most amazing combination. Everyone has always thought of you, Ethel Waters, as a great singer. And then I remember reading so much about how Honey, you dance. Honey, you know I have done blackface comedy. I mean, uh, to get in, I've always been crazy about the theater. And uh, incidentally, I don't know, was something always seemingly, uh, I don't mean about the, the uh, I just wanted to be on the stage and I wanted to be a pony. See, you don't know anything about ponies. A pony is a short, chorus girl. A little short one. And I came here a giraffe, if you like. And I never could get on that front line, so I was willing to go in the back door by just being a, a showgirl, a walk-on. But I always seemed to have something on the ball that I couldn't pose. I never thought that was necessary I, because I had too many defects. So they'd make me a comedian or anything that they would short fall down on by knowing I was available. <laughs> and willing, available water. And willing. <laughs> yeah. So I, when in doing the blackface comedy, uh, I didn't know it at that time. I was much thinner, and I seem to have prominent features. Uh, that is my nose and mouth, and I have a pretty good grain of hair. So the result was they had to take the cork off me because they thought I was a white person, <laughs> you know, from, from the way the cork brought out my features, just like that brown makeup will make you, if you're a colored person, it, it does something. So I had to take that off. I only said that to say the different type of things <laughs> that I did. Then I've been on a carnival, which I forgot to mention that day, and I'm very proud of that because all that gives you experience when you can hit anything right off the ball, just like that grows up in you. You can't get that in the studio. You can't. I don't care if you had a thousand dollars to pay for each lesson from the grandest coaches who will teach you. At no time does your life, I think, run parallel with the other fella. And you got to work out that pattern yourself. So incidentally, when you're left on your own, 
you have resources. And if you have the vivid imagination that I have, being what I am, I mean, it's, it's a joy in being colored because we have a peculiar sort of happy outlook on life and we can get amusement without being silly out of some peculiar tight spots that we can laugh, you know. You laugh sort of all the time when you're singing, when you're what? even singing a sad part of a song, you well, seem I to laugh. Well, I not one if it's too sad, darling. You, then you, it'll come through, the, the hurt that I cover so beautifully because I uh, call myself and rightfully so, the connoisseur of misery. I really know suffering from every angle. It's, I've been tired. I have a PhD on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, when I said that I've worked in the carnival, I've worked in, under blackface, and I came over here in uh, 1917 from Horn and Hardard's uh, bus. I was the main bus girl over there where you bust dishes. At Horn and Hardard? Oh, Lord, yes. I mean, I was pop stuff over there. So. <laughs> did you <laughs> sing while you were bussing dishes? No, I tell you where I did most of my singing. Uh, when I was a kid, I don't still, I don't call myself a singer. I think I recite musically. That's the way I like to term it, and that's the way I think of it in my mind. Because to me, sometimes the word has it, and sometimes the music has it. Sometimes they blend perfectly. And unfortunately for m myself, there's so many beautiful things that have both that I never get the opportunity to do. So I'll just sort of, whatever I get, I make the best of. But uh, I used to be a chambermaid uh, in a hotel uh, at, at, at Broad and Lombard. And uh, incidentally, my grandmother That's was... That's Philadelphia. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother uh, was a pretty strict sort of a person. It wasn't that she... She just didn't uh, encourage anything from the theater because at that time, and still, there isn't much to from the colored angle to do it. I mean, truthfully, unless you get down like you're do we're doing and, and they recognize us now, but those theaters at that time was pretty raw. And uh, I was a kid that, that uh, seemingly knew my way around because I was friendly and I was attractive and I was overgrown for my age. And so she was afraid that I would just be too sinful because it was the Sunday work, you know, that uh, you had to sing and dance on the stage. And she just couldn't see that, you know. It wasn't a matter of the morals as much as it was the religion angle that uh, they just don't want you to be so, commit so much sin, and in Philadelphia too, you know. So she never encouraged me being on the stage because I think mainly because you'd have to work on Sunday if you went out of Philadelphia and you couldn't stay in Philadelphia and work. You couldn't even play baseball in Philadelphia <laughs> for a long time. Well, Sunday I mean, it, truthfully, I mean, and those people, they sort of, they, they live up to that. So uh, she naturally encouraged me to earn an honest dollar by the sweat of my brow, and it has been beautiful since the wars and things because I don't bar nobody in a ra over a range. I stand behind a cook stove and cook with the best of them, and I can wash, iron, cook, and scrub, sing, sure. dance, talk, and whistle. So <laughs> did she give me a good background? <laughs> since you've been busting at Horn and Hardest and been a chambermaid, you don't need any help, do you? <laughs> you can do all that. So when she did that, uh, that stopped me from... Uh, uh, Following up what I thought would be a terrific stage career. So when they, I was busting dishes, oh, I was getting back to the why, what I used to do. So when I was chambermaid, I used to go to the Standard Theater, was on South Street. Every Monday, the Lord said, you find me sitting up there. It was only 10 cents anyhow. And I'm doing the acts, and I see them all come there. And I said to myself, oh, I know I can do this, and I can do that. Well, I had several in my mind, friends that I liked, and several enemies I didn't like. So in my rooms, I'd hurry up and get my room cleaned in the hotel, wherever I'd be working. Then I would proceed to spend the time I could spend in there without being detected, being a performer. And I'd stand in front of the mirror, and I'd be whoever I liked, and I would, and now Ethel Waters is coming on, see? I'd talk to myself, <laughs> and, and Ethel Waters would go out there, and ladies came, and then whoever my enemy was, she was to follow me, and would I hiss her? <laughs> <laughs> this is true as the Lord lets me sit in this chair. I, mean, I think about it now and have hysterics because <laughs> I know what it is, that other fellow. Fortunately, I've never been his. But, oh, God, if, if ever anybody ever did it, you see, the, what I, the weight I put on this imaginary enemy, <laughs> she couldn't do nothing to please me, and quite, quite a few to this day can't either. <laughs> So I was just saying to tell you the, the, the mischievous side of, of my disposition. So when I got the opportunity, like all people, when the time come, I was busting dishes and uh, it was on my birthday and I had to put my age up because 
they wouldn't allow me in, in the cabarets or what they call rascalas then because everybody in Philadelphia knew I was a minor. So uh, I, on Halloween, which is my birthday, I got to hurry up. No, no, take it on easy. On Halloween, now. which is my birthday, they, uh, I was in the, uh, with my bunch and I had my, I was masked because I was wearing, I was a young girl anyhow. So they, I went in this cabaret and we were, there were certain districts and if you belong to a certain district, you know, you had to hold up that district. And uh, so this, everybody got up and sang from their ward, and then they called on me. Well, it was either beat anybody singing to hold up my district in, or get beat up when I when when they took us for letting them down. Oh see. boy, what a spot! So I got up, and uh, believe it or not, the only number I knew at that time. When you're a long, long way from home, it makes you feel like you're alone. That was the song I sang, and it was so pathetic. <laughs> You know, you mean to pick that number? I, I mean, no, it was just that I was scared to death because I never, you know, had the nerve to sing in public. And so, even all that rehearsal in front of the mirror as a chambermaid I hadn't think helped that's you? that's the way the people are today. That's why when they get out here on these amateur hours, they think they're, they're cane, you know, and on... But you're just stage fright. It's something petrifies you. Yeah. So uh, I went over. I held up from my ward because we went into the dance of, of the shimmy. So that, that, that stopped the clock and the, and the traffic and everything. So I was a success, a ballad singer and a shake dancer. <laughs> so standing in the audience was two villains. Uh, at, bless their hearts, a team that was that's passed on. They were the colored comedians. And one was named Arthur Bryce Braxton and uh, another one was named Clarence Nugent. So they said to me, why don't you go on the stage? So I thought, uh, uh, I'm never going to the stage. And they finally went around and got my mother's permission if I would go to Baltimore with them for a week. To, uh, to do this vaudeville act. And uh, she gave consent because I was working at this place and getting 350, and they told her if I went if I went to Baltimore, they'd give me my transportation for the week and give me $9. So, and uh, she said she'd work in my, on my job for a week in case I didn't make good and had to come back, you know, I'd have to go back to work. <laughs> so I went to Baltimore, they said, what song do you know? So I said, I know the St. Louis Blues because I had heard it that week before, introduced by a, an impersonator, and that was the first time it had ever been sung in the, at the Standard Theater. And he said, you mean to say you know the St. Louis Blues? I said, I certainly do. So he, they had to get permission. They sent a special delivery letter to Memphis, Tennessee, and I only wish I had kept that because that was the thing that I got permission from Pace and Handy at that time. They sent me a card back saying it was okay for me to sing the St. Louis Blues, and I was the first colored or white and sing the St. Louis Blues and introduce it. And they used oh. to call me Sweet Mama String Bean. You know, it's okay to sing it right. How did you sing it then, Ethel Waters? Can you remember? Just well, give us an idea. I, I, I sang it so, uh, uh, I was, it was a sort of a uh, patheticness. When I walked on the stage, I was so frightened. The man says, uh, uh, um, Ethel, uh, I said, don't leave me out here. I was scared. So he sat, in the ch sat me in a chair and he says, uh, uh, just say, when I think of how that man treats me, I get the St. Louis Blues. And I just sat down there, and I wouldn't look. I kept my eyes shut. I hate to see that evening sun go down. And I wailed then like I would wail it now. Like, yeah. Time's, time's going on. And you know, I want to say one thing. Everyone has probably been dying to hear you sing Stormy Weather. We're saving that for Wednesday night when you're going to be on our show Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. Ethel Waters is going to be our guest along with Alec Templeton, you know. And I we didn't know. Do that. Isn't that awful? We'll bring you back again. We want to go off the air, listen to your record of summertime. Ethel Waters, thank you. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.